We're going to continue to read about Jesus Messiah. I want to read a passage this evening from the book of Philippians, uh, Philippians chapter 2, and the words will be on the screen if you want to follow along. These are the words of the Apostle Paul. He says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue, should, every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word of God for the people of God. songs that I know of, there may be more, but there's two songs I know of that you can really only sing on this night, on Ash Wednesday. One of them we sang at the beginning of the service tonight, Lord, who threw out these 40 days. The other one is called Sunday's Palms or Wednesday's Ashes. I know, those titles just roll off the tongue, don't they? But that latter song refers to that, the, the older practice of keeping some of the branches that we use on Palm Sunday until the next year and burning them to use on Ash Wednesday. Now, I tried that the first year I was here. Pastor Aaron had left behind the palms from the previous year, and so I took them down to the, the door outside the kitchen by the parking lot and set them on fire. Easy peasy, right? I nearly burned the building down, <laughs> which would have been a real problem since at that point we were just about finished with this building and the rebuild project. So since then, I've chosen to get my ashes not from the previous year's Palm Sunday, but from Cokesbury. <laughs> Lent, Lent is a strange time of year. Doing things like that, it's a strange time of year. I know a lot of traditions that don't observe it, and partly because it's intrusive. It's demanding. If we think of Lent at all, we usually think of that we're supposed to give something up. Or it's the time when Catholics don't eat meat on Fridays. Now, I've noticed uh, savvy marketing pros have tapped into that so the restaurants that could care less about religion the rest of the year start advertising their fish specialties during Lent. Have you noticed that? Even Chick-fil-A, at least last year, they serve fish during Lent, but not, of, of course, on Sundays. I, I don't know if they changed their name to Cod Filet, Jan Janet, do you know? No, it's still Chick-fil-A? Okay. But they serve fish. Everybody's into that. When I was growing up, we didn't observe Ash Wednesday at my home church, and so the only way I knew Lent had begun was when we began getting up early on Sunday mornings to go to breakfast. The, the United Methodist churches in our area had a, at that time had a long tradition of hosting round-robin Lenten breakfasts on Sunday mornings. Every church would take a Sunday, and they'd provide a breakfast and a, and a brief program. But all we had to do, all, all, all of that had to be done in order to get back to our own church for worship. And so my earliest memories of Methodist Lent is, Mike, there we go, egg casserole. That's what Lent meant to me right there. I, I, you know, the more I found out about the actual season, though, I came to realize that's really kind of opposite the spirit of Lent. Lent's supposed to be a season of fasting or, or self-denial or going without so that we can focus on the main reason for these 40 days. This season's not about breakfast or fish or fasting or even giving something up. The, the, the main point of this season is to refocus on Jesus. It's meant to be a time that prepares us to walk with him to the cross and then to the empty tomb. Now, the season of Lent developed early in the history of the church. and In part, it, it was a time for those who had walked away from Jesus and the church to come back, to return, to seek forgiveness, and, and on Easter to be welcomed back into the fellowship of the church. And so Lent began to take on a, a penitential atmosphere, a time for repentance and, and growing faith. But all, always in the center of it was Jesus. Always this awareness that at the end of the 40-day journey is a cross, a cross. 
and a death and ultimately a resurrection, although that's the season of Easter, not Lent. If you count the days from today until the Saturday before Easter, however, you're going to come up with 46 days, not 40. That's because Sundays are not considered part of Lent. Sundays are always a self. Several years ago, a friend of mine decided that, it, that one of the things that got in the way of his relationship with Jesus was watching sports on television. And so he decided he would give that up during Lent. And he'd have all this extra time, he said, to spend with Jesus. And then somebody reminded him that March Madness happens during Lent. And my friend loves basketball. Thankfully, he remembered that Sundays are not part of Lent, and so he could watch basketball on Sundays. That might be within the bounds of Lent. I'm not sure it captures the spirit of Lent. Because the whole point of whatever we do during this season is to help us draw closer to Jesus. Every bit as much and, and, and maybe more as, as Advent, Jesus is the reason for the season. But which Jesus? I mean, that's really the challenge today. Which Jesus is it we're trying to get close to? If you'll pardon my gra bad grammar, there are a lot of Jesuses out there today. There's the, the conservative Jesus and the liberal Jesus. There's the Democrat Jesus, the Republican Jesus. There's the Jesus who prefers hymns and the Jesus who prefers contemporary music. There's the gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and the Mr. Rogers look-alike Jesus. There's the nationalistic Jesus and the legalistic Jesus and the tree-hugger Jesus and the angry Jesus and the Jesus who loves me but hates all my enemies and the Jesus who seems to pretty much agree with everything I think. Isn't it amazing how often I remake Jesus in my own image? How often I end up worshiping a Jesus who is surprisingly just like me, who has my values and who would never question my choices. 18th century French writer Voltaire observed that God created us in our own image and with him we returned the favor. In our world though today, a lot of people say they like Jesus. You know, Muslims like Jesus as a prophet, just behind Muhammad. Spiritualists like Jesus, he's one of the most enlightened human beings to ever live. Jews like Jesus, historically, he, he was a reformer. He took on the rulers and authorities and unfortunately got himself killed doing so. Even a lot of atheists like Jesus. He was a good man. He was a social reformer who taught that everybody should just love everybody else. And no one who's serious about history denies that Jesus existed. And most people like him. At least they like the Jesus that they choose to create in their own thoughts. The Jesus they get when they pick and choose who he was and what he said. Everybody likes Jesus, as long as it's the Jesus we design. Which Jesus do we worship? Which Jesus are we going to pursue this Lenten season? Paul was a one-time persecutor of the church. And he encountered Jesus in a powerful and life-changing way. You may remember his story. He was on his way to some Christians because of their belief in Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior. And he was literally knocked to the ground by a blinding light. And then he heard a voice from heaven that says, why do you persecute me? It was Jesus. And Paul was never the same. After wiping out the, the followers of Jesus, became a follower himself. He no longer traveled with murderous intent, but with saving hope. And he traveled all across the Roman Empire preaching the good news about this Jesus. And then he wrote letters. Letters which continue to help us not only know how to live the Christian life, but also how to understand who Jesus is. While the, while the Gospels, which we're going to look a lot at a lot during Lent, the Gospels help us learn what Jesus did and taught. Paul helps us understand what it all means. And in the passage that we read tonight, Paul is trying to help the Philippians find a path to, to unity, something to unify around. And he does that by reminding them what Jesus was like, the real Jesus. Not the Jesus they'd made up in their heads. Not, Jesus, not the Jesus they wished he was. The Jesus Paul had encountered along the road and the Jesus he had, taught, he had been taught about from those who knew him directly was the Jesus Paul wanted the Philippians to fall in love with. And most scholars, a lot of scholars think Paul's quoting an, an ancient hymn in this passage. Some others think he may have written this poem himself. Either way, these are some of the most beautiful and, and moving words Paul ever put to paper. And so in these words, whether they're lyrics borrowed or created, Paul gives us an image of the real, authentic Jesus. And this passage is, is rich. It's, it's far too rich for us to cover in depth tonight. But for our purposes, as we kind of launch into this, this series, this Lenten series, I want to give you three words to remember. Three, uh, three hooks 
that you can hang your thought, some thoughts about Jesus tonight. And in good preacher fashion, they all begin with the same letter. So the first word tonight is lowered. Verses 6 through 8, Paul very poetically talks about Jesus coming to earth, that, that this one who was God came down to live and walk among us. He made himself nothing, Paul says. In those verses, we find the, the, the basis for the, the idea for the doctrine that Jesus is both fully God and fully human. But unfortunately, older translations talked about Jesus emptying himself. That kind of gives us the image of, of something being poured out, something being lost, how we empty a glass or a box and we don't leave anything behind. That's not, that's not what Paul's saying. Jesus didn't give up any of his divinity when he came to earth. There's a whole lot of technical stuff that goes into the, to the original language here. I'm not going to bore you with that tonight. But here's what Paul's saying in a nutshell. Jesus' nature, his, his essence, who he was, didn't change. When he became human, he was every bit as much as God as he was before. His outward appearance changed. He added to what he was before. He became human. He was fully God and fully human all at the same time. <laughs> Mind blown. Because it's a mind-blowing, it's a, it's a hard-to-grasp idea. But how else could he reach us? As God, he was way beyond our comprehension. He had to become like us in order to reach us, in order for us to pay attention to him or even be in his presence. He lowered himself, and he chose to do that. In fact, Paul says he came as a slave. Servant is not a strong enough translation there in verse 7. When we think of a servant, we usually think maybe of something like, uh, like on Downton Abbey or some other historical show. You know, the servants, they're, they're lesser in status, but they're treated somewhat like extended family. Now, the, Paul, the image Paul has in mind is a slave, a person without advantages or rights or, or privileges. It's, it's, a, it's a nobody, a nothing. Someone who would be, as the prophet Isaiah said centuries before, someone who would be despised, rejected, thought of as nothing. Jesus lowered himself, but we don't like that kind of Jesus. I mean, we, we want someone important, you know, a celebrity, a, a somebody rich and powerful and prosperous, not a slave who made himself nothing. And yet that's the way Scripture says he came. He lowered himself. Second word for tonight is love. It's in verse 8. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Elsewhere, Paul says, you know, it, it's hard to find someone who would die for you. We often say, you know, we would die for members of our family, but beyond that, most people aren't willing to die for somebody else, no matter how good a person they might be. But Jesus died for us even when we weren't good, while we were still sinners, while we were still rebelling, rebelling against him, while we had nothing good to say about him. Jesus died for us even then. And, and yes, he did a lot of teaching about how people ought to live, but his main purpose in, in coming and lowering himself was to love us all by offering his life in our place. He took our sin on himself and in some way that we don't fully understand, he dealt with it, took care of it through his death on the cross. He looked down through the hallways of history and he saw you and he saw me and he, and he, he saw all the sin that we would, the, the mess that we would get ourselves into and he still loved us. Greater love has no one than this, he told his disciples, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And on that same evening, his last night with them, he reminded them, that his main command to them was to love each other the way he had loved them. Love each other with your lives, he says. Love looks like a cross. And Jesus ultimately won our hearts, not with a demonstration of power, but by showing us love we couldn't resist. His death wasn't an accident or a mistake in judgment. It wasn't something engineered by, by, by Rome or planned by the Jewish leaders. It was his reason for coming. His death was an act of love. Our response then is to acknowledge who Jesus is. Paul put it this way. He says, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the third word for tonight is Lord. That's who Jesus is. The very first statement of belief in the, uh, the Christian creed consisted of three words in English. Jesus is Lord. Lord. 
Now today we have longer creeds. We have the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. And those were, those, those were developed throughout the centuries to kind of sort out theological issues. But in the early church, all they knew was Jesus is Lord. Now the danger of that creed in that world was that he was not the only one claiming to be Lord. Caesar also claimed to be Lord. Augustus Caesar, the, the current Roman emperor at the time, he'd put an end to the Roman Civil War. He had, he had brought in the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, to the whole known world. He had military savvy. He had organizational skills. And it wasn't long before people began to see him as, as more than a man. He must be divine. He must be a god. And so Caesar as Lord became the accepted creed of the empire. Before Augustus, there had been another lord, Alexander the Great. By the age of 33, he had conquered most of the known world for Greece, and he himself suggested, you know, you might want to think of me as divine. Now, that's pretty, pretty bold, isn't it? It takes some ego to say, you know, I, I might be a god, just might be. Nevertheless, for a while, Alexander is lord. That was the creed of the known world. And now along come, along come these Christians who claim Jesus is lord. Jesus, son of a carpenter from a dinky little town in the northern part of an insignificant province, a town that was not even important enough to be mentioned on the maps at the time. Jesus, who, who gained some notoriety with his teaching, but then he was executed as a criminal. That Jesus is Lord. Not Augustus, not Alexander. These crazy Christians dared to claim that, that Jesus was the reality and Alexander and, and, and Augustus were the, the caricature. And we still claim that. 2,000 years later, there is no other Lord than Jesus. And that's pretty quickly becoming every bit as radical an idea in our time as it was in the first century. There are lots of lords vying for our attention today. They want our allegiance. They want our worship. And every year, Lent comes along and asks us, who will you follow? Who is your Lord. This is the biblical Jesus, the one who is lowered to the, price of, to the place of a slave, the one who loves without condition, without end, and the one who is Lord over everything that we see and know. He's more fearsome and more loving than we could ever imagine. He's not the meek and mild Savior we, we think about, nor is he the personal assistant that we seem to think we want. He's not Siri or Alexa or Google. Jesus is so much more than the, than, than the God we create in our minds. And so shouldn't we start with Jesus himself and rethink our whole picture of God around him? And so we're going to do that this Lenten season. We're going to go about it by looking at some assumptions, even some objections people have to Jesus. We're going to look at some times when Jesus seems to have been behaving badly, like when he talked about scorching the earth, or when he preached about hell, or when he seemed to be legalistic, or even racist. Along the way, we're going to see some surprising pictures because Jesus is anything but meek and mild, and he just might challenge some of our own sacred cows. You know, one of my favorite scenes in the Chronicles of Narnia comes early on in, in the, the first book written, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And the children are trying to figure out who this Aslan character is that Mr. Be Mr. and Mrs. Beaver keep talking about. He's a, he's a lion, they said, and he's the king of the beasts. And, and it's obvious he's pretty fearsome. And so the children ask, is he safe? Mr. Beaver responds, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. That's about as good a description of Jesus as I've ever heard. He's not safe, but he's good. He's the king. He's the Lord. And so tonight we have a chance to begin this Lenten season by acknowledging our own mortality, our own lowering. We have a chance to at least symbolically lower ourselves with Jesus. Ashes have always been a, a symbol of mourning. In, in the book of Job, Job sits in ashes when he's mourning the loss of his property and his family. And early in church history, ashes become, it became a symbol of mourning our sins. Tonight, as we begin another Lenten journey with Jesus, in just a few moments, you're going to be invited to come and receive the sign of the cross marked in ashes on your forehead. It's kind of a symbolic way of saying, I want to walk with Jesus wherever he leads. The band's going to come and help prepare our hearts for these ashes, but I, as, they, as they come, I wanted to share the words 
of one of those songs I mentioned a few years, a few moments ago, and, and use these words as a prayer tonight. Sunday's palms are Wednesday's ashes as another Lent begins. Thus we kneel before our Maker in contrition for our sins. We have marred baptismal pledges in rebellion, gone astray. Now returning, seek forgiveness. Grant us pardon, God, this day. Amen.